Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about orthogonality in vector spaces, in general inner product spaces. So let V be a vector space, a fixed vector space that has an inner product. Remember that an inner product is a bilinear map from V cross V to, in this case, we'll go with the real numbers. This can all be extended to work with the complex numbers, keeping in mind what we talked about, um, about complex vector spaces. Uh, so a bilinear map that is positive, definite, and symmetric. So, for example, there's the n-dimensional Euclidean space with the dot product. That's your favorite inner product space, and it's a great place to drive your intuition. But you could also think, take the twice continuously differentiable functions on 0, 1, who, where the inner product is, is the L2 inner product, the integral from 0 to 1 of the product of the two functions. That's another good thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about inner products. They're, they give you a nice class of examples. So I'm going to say, and just recall from, say, calculus class, that two vectors in uh, any inner product space are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. So you know this from Euclidean space, say, R3. And then I'm just going to define it in a general inner product space to be the same thing. And we'll say, suppose that I had a basis v1 through vn of v. That means that v is n-dimensional here. I'm going to call that basis an orthogonal basis of v. So the basis itself is orthogonal. If the collection of vectors that make it up are mutually orthogonal, what does that mean? Mutually orthogonal means that if I take a vi and I take the dot product with a vj, I get zero as long as i is different than j. And what about when i equals i? Well, if I also have the condition on this basis that when I take the inner product of a vector vi with itself, vi dot vi, so I can correct that, I get if I if I take vi dot vi and I get one back, that means that vi is a unit vector for each i. Then I'm going to call this basis not just orthogonal but orthonormal. Remember that a normal vector. Uh, I know this is an overloaded overloaded term, but normal sometimes means unit length in math. So I'm going to call this an orthonormal basis if all the vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other and each one has length of one. That's the that's the point. So. A great example to bear in mind here is called the standard basis of Rn that you've been working with for some time. Uh, E1 is the vector that's got 1 in the first slot and zeros elsewhere. E2 has a 1 in the second slot and zeros elsewhere. And so on. That's 0, 1, 0, dot, 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 0. Uh, and En has got a 0 zeros everywhere except the last slot. Okay, so that is uh, the standard basis of Rn. And it's easy to check that this is an orthonormal basis. It's a good example to keep in mind. Now I want to point out that if you have an orthogonal basis, then it won't be very hard for you to build yourself an orthonormal basis. So anytime you get an orthogonal basis, you can always convert it in a pretty easy way into an orthonormal basis. That just means that if you have a bunch of vectors that are all mutually perpendicular, you can scale them to have length 1. And how do you scale them? You hopefully remember this from calculus class, but we'll go over it again. If I have a bunch of vectors, v1 through vn, and they're already mutually orthogonal, then whoosh, I can get a new set of n vectors, they won't be the same vectors unless the original ones were already unit length, but just divide by the norm of each vector. So v1, scale it off by its own length. v2, divide by its own length. And so on, all the way down to vn. Take vn divided by the norm of vn. And you're going to find that what you have, if the original vectors were mutually orthogonal, then your new vectors remain mutually orthogonal. And they're length 1 because I scaled them by dividing by their length. So maybe we'll just go through, keeping in mind that the inner product is bilinear here. Uh, if I take vi over norm vi, and take the dot product with itself, vi over norm vi, didn't matter that vi might not have had length 1. This new vector should have length 1. 
Well, if I pull out 1 over norm vi twice, it's bilinear, I'm allowed to do that. Then I get a vi dot vi on the top and a norm vi squared on the bottom, but that's also a norm vi squared on top and bottom, and that's 1. So the norm of these new vectors, they're all of norm 1. And if you took an inner product of a vi with a vj, or rather a vi over norm vi and a vj over norm vj, the new scaled unit length vectors. Well, it, again, you can pull out that norm vi, norm vj out of the bottom and still have a vi dot vj on top, and that's still zero. So, let's do a quick example. Suppose that I have the following three vectors, minus 7, 4, 4, 4, minus 1, 8, 4, 8, minus 1. So I claim that these three vectors are mutually orthogonal. You need to stop the video and check that if I take the dot product of any pair of those three vectors, so there are three pairs for you to check, that those three vectors are orthogonal. In fact, I claim that they're an ortho orthogonal basis of R3, and we're going to see a quick way to check that pretty shortly. Now, the norm of this first vector is 9, and you can check that pretty... In fact, the norm of all three of these vectors is 9. And you can check that pretty easily, but you just got to take the square root of the sum of the squares of the entries. And the first entry squared is 49, the second and third entry squared is 16. Uh, and so add up the squares and take the square root, you get 9 in all three cases. So all of these have length 9. So if I want an orthonormal basis, I should just take each of these vectors and divide it by 9. Take 1 ninth times this vector, 1 ninth times minus 7, 4, 4. 1 ninth times 4 minus 1, 8, and 1 ninth times 4, 8 minus 1. So I'm going to write that in in terms of fractions. It's not new. I use this opportunity to explain that pretty shortly we're going to see that those vectors being orthogonal, and there being three of them, is enough to guarantee that it's a basis of R3. And that is a very useful fact that will come in handy lots of times this semester. So that fact is actually so important that it deserves its own slide. So the important fact that I'll actually prove here is that if you take an orthogonal set of vectors, well, let me suppose that all of the vectors are non-zero, but that's not terribly, it's not terribly interesting if I include the zero vector. It, an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors is automatically linearly independent for free. If you can check that your vectors are orthogonal, then they are definitely linearly independent. They can't have any relations of linear dependence between them. I'll give you a proof. Well, if I'm going to prove something about some collection of vectors, why don't I name them? Let's call them v1 through vn, where n is some positive integer. Let them all be non-zero. Take n non-zero and mutually orthogonal vectors. I'm going to claim that they're linearly independent. And how do I prove? Okay, so when I say that they're mutually orthogonal, again, I mean that vi dot vj is zero for every i and j that are different than each other. So how do I show something is linearly independent? How do I show a set of vectors is independent? I suppose that I had some scalars that had the unusual and strange, bizarre property that if I take the linear combination of these vi's with those scalars, the ci's, so c1, v1, plus c2, v2, plus blah, 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 plus cn, vn, and I got zero. Suppose that I had some magical numbers like that. To prove that the vectors are independent, I need to deduce that the ci's are all zero. Now, what I'm going to do is, for every i, take vi dot this linear combination. Well, that combination is 0, so vi dot 0 is 0. But on the other hand, it's vi dot, well, c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus blah 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 plus cn vn. And I'm going to use the bilinearity of my inner product to break this up over all those plus signs. So in the first part, I'll have v1 c1 v1. Sorry, this is vi. vi, 
C1, V1, plus VI, C2, V2. I didn't label my C1, C1, C2, V2, plus blah, 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 at the end, VI, CN, VN. And now I can pull all, the, the, all of those scalars out, again, using the bilinearity. So I get C1 times VI dot V1, plus C2 times VI dot V2, and so on. And at the end, I end up on the last term, it's CN, VI dot VN. But all, most all of those dot products are zero, because I've assumed that the VIs are mutually orthogonal. So all that I'm left with is the ith term, CI times VI dot VI or in other words, ci times the norm of vi squared. Now I've assumed that none of the vi's are zero, and because this is an inner product and it's positive definite, the norm of vi can't be zero unless vi is zero. So if this product ci times norm vi squared is zero, as we've assumed that it is, we must have ci's all being zero. And that's exactly what we needed to prove to show that the set of vectors v1 through vn was linearly independent. We deduced that c1 through cn are all equal to zero. They have to be. And that's exactly what you need to deduce independence of these orthogonal vectors. So that's the proof. So there's a useful and important and easy to prove corollary of the theorem that was on the last slide. If you take a mutually orthogonal set of, again, non-zero vectors, well, maybe they're not a basis for the whole vector space that they live in, but they are linearly independent, and any linearly independent set is a basis for whatever it spans. So if you take the span of v1 through vn, that's a vector space, maybe a subspace of the space that v1 through vn lie in. And v1 through vn are a basis for that subspace. Let me give you an example. Suppose I take the following three polynomials, 1, x, and x squared. These are, this set of three polynomials is a subset of P2, the polynomials of degree at most 2. And this is an inner, this is an inner product space in the same way that we've been doing for a while. Take the inner product of any two functions and to be the integral of the product of those two functions on zero to one. That's a good inner product. This makes this an inner product space. Notice that these three polynomials that I started with, one x and x squared, are not mutually orthogonal. And all I need to check that this set of three things is not all mutually orthogonal is to check the inner product of any of, of one pair to find, let's say I take the inner product of 1 and x, I get a half. That's not 0, so this is not an orthogonal set of vectors. OK, well, wouldn't it be nice if I could find an orthogonal basis of P2? We'll see soon that it will be a very useful thing to have an orthogonal basis. Well, how can I do it? Mm, why don't I just show you one? not show you how I found it. So my basis is going to consist of the three polynomials x. It's a good one. 1 minus 3 halves x. Where does that 3 halves come from? x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. 1 sixth? Where did that come from? You will soon see. Well, it's easy to check that this is an orthogonal set of vectors. How to find it? is a different question. But to check that you have a set of orthogonal vectors, all you need to do is take dot products. How many dot products are there? There's the dot product of x and 1 minus 3 halves x. Take that integral of that product, you'll find it's 0. There's the dot product of x with x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. That's the, that's the integral of this product. You'll find when you take this, that's 0. And there's the integral of the product, uh, so there's a dot product of 1 minus 3 halves x and x squared minus x plus 1 sixth, which is the integral of the product of those two functions. That's also 0, as you can check. So it follows immediately that these three polynomials are linearly independent. Maybe that was not obvious before, but it's obvious now. Now that you know that they are orthogonal to each other, 
They are for free, they are linearly independent. And they live in a three-dimensional vector space. You know that P2 is three-dimensional because you've seen a basis for it before having three things. So there are three of them and they're independent in a three-dimensional vector space. Okay, they're a basis for P2. Done and done. So as for how we found this orthogonal basis of P2, there's a justifiably famous thing called the Gram-Schmidt process that we'll go into in great detail very soon. So stay tuned. So let me give you a useful application of these orthogonal bases. So recall that if I have a basis V1 through Vn of my vector space, and let me not assume right now that it's orthogonal or anything else, it's just a linearly independent spanning set. If I take any such basis and I take any vector V and V, then because my basis is a spanning set, there are some constants for which V is a linear combination of V1 through Vn. And because V1 through Vn are linearly independent, those constants are the only constants that do that job. They're unique scalars, let's say C1 through Cn, that are real numbers, such that V, this given vector, is a linear combination C times V1 plus C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 plus and so on plus Cn times Vn. They're the only scalars that do that, and there are some. If V is zero, then they're all zero. But in any case, these Cs are called the coordinates of V with the vector V with respect to the basis V1 through Vn. If you change what basis you're talking about, the Cs change. And so it's like changing what coordinate system you're working in. Now, one major question, if you already have a fixed basis, is, well, how do I find the coordinates of some vector relative to some basis? And in general, the answer is reduce. You put the vectors as the columns of a matrix, as long as you're working in, say, a vector space, which is a version of Rn, and you can row reduce to find the scalars Cs. In, in fact, if, so the, the f beautiful and, and wonderful fact here is that if your basis was better than just any basis, and it was an orthogonal basis, well, it all gets much easier. So if I take an orthogonal basis of V, then those coordinates, those Cis, they're very easy to find. Ci is just the V dot Vi. That's all you have to do. So for each I, in order to compute the coordinate and the, the, the ith coordinate of a vector, you just dot product V with the Vi. Uh, not only that, but if you wanted the norm of V, that's just the summation of the squares of the coordinates. Uh, that should be norm V squared. So let's do a quick example. We had a basis before uh, that was an orthogonal, no, in fact, it was an orthonormal basis of R3. So I'm going to write the vector 1, 1, 1 in terms of that basis. So the basis that we had before, uh, it was 1 ninth times minus 7, 4, 4. 1 ninth times 4 minus 1, 8, and 1 ninth times 4, 8 minus 1. So I'm going to take that basis, which we've already checked is orthonormal, and see that the quickest, the, so the, the, the way to see 1, 1, 1 as a linear combination of those three vectors is the, for the first coordinate, take the dot product of 1, 1, 1 with the first vector, that's a number, Multiply that number by the vector one ninth times seven ninths or seven minus seven four four. Uh, there should be a minus seven ninths there. To see what the second coordinate is, just take the dot product of one 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 with the second vector four ninths minus one ninth eight ninth, and multiply that number by the second vector. And similarly, if you want the third coordinate, that's the constant, the scalar that is what multiple of the third vector you need, and that multiple is the dot product of the vector you want, 1, 1, 1, with the third basis vector. So you can express 1, 1, 1 as exactly this combination of those three vectors. And it's easy to compute what those dot products are, and it's com computationally cheap 
to compute what those dot products are. It's much cheaper than row reduction. If you already know you have an orthogonal basis, this is a much faster thing to do. So in this case, you get one ninth for the first coordinate, four ninths for the second coordinate, and uh, four ninths again, I think. Sorry, it was 11 ninths. One ninth, one ninth 11 ninths, and uh, 11 ninths again. Those are the three coordinates of 1, 1, 1 relative to this basis. So it's 1 ninth times the first, plus 11 ninths times the second, plus 11 ninths times the third. So let me just demonstrate what you would have to do if you did not have this formula. If you did not know that this basis was already orthogonal, what would you have to do? Well, if you want some scalars for which the, the first vector minus 7 ninths, 4 ninths, 4 ninths times some number plus 4 ninths minus 1 ninth, 8 ninths times some other number plus 4 ninths, 8 ninths minus 1 ninth times some third number equals 1, 1, 1. Well, you would need to put those as the columns of a matrix because matrix multiplication is linear combination. And then you would augment with a column of ones and you would row reduce that. And what you would get at the very end of the day, so you would solve that, this, the, the associated system of linear equations, and at the end of the day, you would get the coefficients that we got already, and it would take you considerably more work. Just wanted to demonstrate, and this is what I meant when I said to row reduce. Now, if your v1 through vn are just orthogonal and not orthonormal, well, it's still not too bad. So this is the more general situation. The, this, the formula that I'm going to give you right here is the same as the formula for the orthonormal ones. It's just that I've, in, in that one, I've divided by one. So you'll see. The coordinates of v relative to your basis, v1 through vn, you take the dot product of v with vi. That's the scalar you need. And you just need to divide by the norm of vi squared. OK. Let's give a quick example. Suppose I have these three polynomials. These were the polynomials that were my orthogonal basis in P2, the polynomials of degree of most two. So x, 1 minus 3 halves x, and x squared plus x, x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. So this was an orthogonal basis of P2. OK, if it's a basis, then it spans all quadratic polynomials. Now here's a quadratic polynomial, x squared plus x plus 1. If this is in the span of those three vectors, and we've proved that it is, then I must be able to write it as a linear combination of those three. What linear combination? So again, if x squared plus x plus 1 is some quadratic polynomial, well, it looks like some multiple of x plus some multiple of 1 minus 3 halves x plus some other multiple of x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. And those multiples are exactly the coordinates that I was talking about. And we have a formula for those coordinates. It's just the inner product, v with vi, where v1 is x, v2 is 1 minus 3 halves x, and v3 is x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. So I take the inner product of the vector x squared plus x plus 1 with each basis vector and divide by the length squared of that basis vector, where length is given in terms of the inner product which, again, is the integral from 0 to 1. So C1 is the inner product of x squared plus x plus 1 with x over the inner product of x with itself times x. So that's a number, and I multiply by the vector x. Plus, well, to get the second coordinate, you take the inner product of x squared plus x plus 1 with 1 minus 3 halves x and divide by the inner product of 1 minus 3 halves x with itself, that's the length squared, and multiply that whole fraction, which is just a number, by 1 minus 3 halves x. And finally, to get the third coordinate of x squared plus x plus 1 relative to this basis, you take the inner product of it with the third vector and divide by the length of the third basis vector squared. This trick won't work if your basis was not orthogonal to begin with. But if it was, then this formula is good, and you're good to go. So when you multiply those, when you take those inner products, you're really computing integrals. So the first one, you're going to integrate uh, x cubed plus x squared plus x over 0, 1, and divide by the integral of x squared over 0, 1. 
which is where I'm getting those fractions. Then you're going to integrate the product of x squared plus x plus 1 and 1 minus 3 halves x on 0, 1 for the top of the next coordinate and get 5 24 and so on for each of these fractions. I had Wolfram Alpha do this for me, so that was not so bad. And what you see at the end of the day, after you simplify some fractions, is you get 13 fourths times x plus 5 sixths times 1 minus 3 halves x plus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1 sixth. And that shouldn't be terribly surprising because there was only one way to get an x squared out of this, and so we're going to need that. What I've outlined in blue here is the orthogonal projection of x squared plus x plus 1 onto x. And we're going to talk more about that geometrically, what it might mean soon. Uh, but in essence, what you can do with an orthogonal basis, if you want to know the coordinates in it, is, it, is project each project onto each member of the orthogonal basis. And we're going to see more of that very soon. Now I want to wrap up with a really important example from Fourier analysis. Suppose I take the following vector space. I'm going to call it Tn for trigonometry. This is the vector space of, we're going to call them trigonometric polynomials. So they're powers of sine times powers of cosine, of sums of such things. So, and I'm going to fix their total degree, where I mean how high of a power did I take sine, and how high of a power did I take cosine, and the sum of those things will be the degree. So the, I'm going to take the polynomials of degree at most n, uh, in much the, way, the same way as I took polynomials uh, pn. I, I need the trigonometric polynomials. I need to bound the degree above. So a general polynomial here will look like, say, t of x. It's a summation of some multiple that depends on two variables, uh, j and k, some summation of cosine to the j of x's times sine to the k of x's. And the a, j, k's are some arbitrary scalars that depend on j and k, and just need to insist that j plus k be at most n. Now, these monomials, cosine to the j of x times sine to the k of x, they span tn. So and I, I, let me insist that j plus k add up to no more than n. They span Tn, and that's groovy, that's fine. But there's something sad about them, and what's sad about them is that if you think about it for a minute, you'll find that they're really, really literally dependent. And that's not great. It tells you that you don't have a basis, so your expression of T of x is not unique. Well, for example, you can take uh, j is 2 and k is 0 to get cosine squared x, and you can get j is 0 and k is 2 to get sine squared x, but cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, so and that's cosine 0 of x and sine o. Oh. Hmm. Right? So you see that these are badly linearly dependent. Now there is a, let's call it a good spanning set for now. 1 cosine x sine x cosine 2x, sine 2x, and you can see, use a double angle formula to see good things here. Uh, and keep going, uh, cosine 3x, sine 3x, all the way up to cosine of nx, sine of nx. There are 2n plus 1 of those functions. Well, these are at least mutually orthogonal. They do span uh, tn of x. So I should say is what they at least span this space. And what you can do fairly easily, it's elementary if not easy, is to check that they are mutually orthogonal with respect to the following inner product, the one where you integrate the product of the two functions. And let me take it from minus pi to pi, because I haven't normalized my trig functions. OK. So easy. It should go in quotes here. It's easy to check. Uh, it's fundamental calculus to check that these functions are all mutually orthogonal. But if they're mutually orthogonal and they span, well, orthogonal things form a basis of whatever they span. So these are so they're because they're orthogonal, they're automatically linearly independent, and they span T n, which tells you that they are a basis for T n. And since there are two n plus one of them, the dimension of this space T n is two n plus one. This was not obvious to begin with. So here's the big idea with these trigonometric polynomials. 
any trigonometric polynomial that you like, and those express all kinds of interesting and complicated waveforms, any trigonometric polynomial that you like can be expressed uniquely in terms of this basis, the 1 cosine x, cosine of 2x, etc., cosine of nx, and sine of x, and sine of 2x, and so on. So, moreover, because those are orthogonal, the coordinates that you need to express your random trigonometric polynomial in terms of them is given by an inner product, and an inner product in this vector space is just an integral. So as soon as you can do integrals, you'll need to do lots of them to get all the coefficients, but you'll find that you can suddenly express trig functions, complicated trig functions, in terms of a nice, simple, easy class of them. Let's do an example. If I have cosine of x times sine squared x, it's some multiple of 1 plus some multiple of cosine plus some multiple of cosine 2x plus some multiple of cosine 3x, and ditto, there's some coefficients for sine, sine of 2x, and sine of 3x. You can tell that you can only, you can stop at 3, because the degree of this polynomial, cosine of x times sine squared x, is 3. Now, the ai's are exactly given by the formula that I've given you before. You should take the inner product of cosine x sine squared x with the ith basis vector, the ith a type vector, let's call those cosines, and we'll call the b's sine. So cosine of, say, ix and then divide by cosine of ix with cosine of ix. That's some integrals, right? And the top of that is cosine of x times sine squared of x times cosine of ix integrate from minus pi to pi. The bottom of that fraction is very similar, cosine squared of ix and integrate from minus pi to pi. Now the bi's, well, now I just need to put sine of ix in the right-hand coordinate of my inner products, and otherwise the formulas are, are just the same. So here i is ranging from 0 to 3 for the ai's and let's say 1 to 3 for the bi's. Uh, so, oh, and a0 is the, uh, okay, cosine of 0x is 1, very good. So if you compute those integrals, you'll find that a0 is 0, a1 is 1 fourth, a2 is 0, and a3 is minus 1 fourth. I encourage you to go check this for yourself. And all of the b's are 0. What does this tell you? This tells you a brand new trig identity that we could probably prove if we set our minds to it. But the trig identity says cosine of x times sine squared of x is the same function as 1 fourth cosine x minus 1 fourth cosine of 3x. And now, I think this is a good place to stop. <laughs>